got you there with got you got you what got you there with Sean Delaney. I'm Sean Delaney, and today on What Got You There, I have the pleasure of speaking with James Heskett. Now, James is someone who knows more about company culture than probably anyone, but that's not all James knows about. He's been at Harvard Business School since 1965, and during that time, he's worked in marketing, business, logistics, operations, policy, and of course, culture. And that's what we're going to talk a lot about today. What makes a company culture great? What makes a company culture unique? What is culture? How can we understand culture to make our companies more successful? If you're interested in entrepreneurship, business, culture, anything like that, you're going to love this conversation with James Heskett. James Heskett, welcome to What Got You There. How are you doing today? Just fine, Sean. Great. And you? I'm doing very well. Uh, you you know how much your work's impacted me. Uh, so <laughs> the smile on my face, you can, you can tell how excited I am. Where I actually want to start, though, is something interesting. I, I love people who seem to be able to, to grasp a lot of different things. And you have quite a multidisciplinary approach to life. So I, I just want to start with a little background here. You've been at Harvard Business School since 1965. And at different times, you've taught courses in marketing, business logistics, the management of service operations, business policy, service management, general management, and the entrepreneurial <laughs> manager. As, and you've also served as senior associate dean in charge of academic programs. So I just have to begin, like, have you always been interested in, in multiple things, multiple domains? Because that breadth uh, of understanding is just remarkable to me. Yeah, I guess so. I, at least uh, I'm I've been interested in a sequential way, in, in, in a way that uh, uh, it, it creates a sense of movement. Uh, I've always liked to be kind of on the move intellectually, and uh, the academic world has provided a wonderful opportunity to do that. Um, you know, sometimes we tend to get pigeonholed, but I've been very fortunate in being associated with organizations that uh, that valued uh, breadth uh, as much as depth, and uh, uh, were willing to allow me to you know to kind of travel across disciplines to some extent. Uh, at least three. Uh, first of all, getting involved in. Uh, logistics, going back to my doctoral work, and and then teaching after that. Uh, a transition to managing in the service economy, uh, about which I wrote a book in 1986, and uh, and then kind of a, a, a natural progression from some of the uh, uh, more effective service providers to uh, the, that relied heavily on culture to the whole area of organizational culture that I've been uh, working in most recently. So, and I've been fortunate enough to be able to, to teach alongside of the research in those areas in ways that uh, kind of fed my curiosity. How much of a positive benefit did the, the teaching have uh, moving in parallel with the research? Uh, I, I have to assume when I, when I teach things, it just seems that I grasp the concept so much better. Is that the case for yourself? Yeah. In order to learn something, you really ought to okay. teach it. So, uh, and I guess that's been sort of the story of my uh, of my life. Um, I uh, coming out of Stanford uh, with a a, a, a multidisciplinary doctorate, which was the case at Stanford in that time. You had to have four fields of study. So I guess maybe that was an early influence on me as far as different fields. I had kind of a natural uh, curiosity about what they were doing because students went wild. I mean, they, they flocked to the service management courses. And over a period of time, we uh, uh, had a chance to uh, uh, do a lot of work in the service sector. I wrote a, a, a book called Managing in the Service Economy in 1986. And, uh, and in the process of writing the cases for the service management course, I came across two organizations that just blew me away. One was the Shouldice Hospital in Toronto, Canada, that was uh, providing an incredible service uh, and had an outstanding culture within the organization. 
and the other was Southwest Airlines, where uh, I, I just, uh, uh, you know, I, I couldn't get enough of it. I spent time down there. I got to know Herb Kelleher and, and Colleen uh, Barrett very well. Um, and uh, we'll never forget, you know, sitting in Herb's office uh, as the clock hits four o'clock and he's got his bottle of wild turkey in the bottom right hand drawer. And, he offers you a drink and you say, uh, it's a little early. Herb, he said, yeah, it's five o'clock oh, somewhere on the system. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that, that was a natural uh, transition to the culture, uh, the, the subject of culture and uh, becoming more interested in it. John Cotter was, at the time, was also interested in the work that uh, uh, Terry Deal and uh, David Kennedy were doing and uh, uh, in culture uh, at about that in 1982. Uh, Tom Peters and uh, and uh, Bob Waterman had written their book In Search of Excellence, which had a lot to do with organization culture. If you go back and read that book, yeah, and we, so, we've had uh, we've had Tom Peters on the show before. He's talked about that um, about right. book and some okay. more stuff. Yeah, terrific. So. It was kind of a natural transition. People say, I, boy, what's the connection? Well, I think there's a very logical connection. So I've been, a, I've been fortunate to be able to work in the areas of logistics, service, and organizational culture over the years um, in ways that uh, you know, have left me uh, still enjoying what I do. And, uh, and, and uh, who knows what the next area of interest will be? Well, that, that, that's one of the, the interesting things thus far is almost approaching things from that curiosity standpoint. It's like, who knows what this is going to lead to? I, I was really intrigued because it seems like early on in your career, you passed on multiple opportunities with, quote unquote, better positions or higher paying salaries. Um, and so I'm just wondering, like when those final decisions were made to take that, that role at Harvard, passing up on, on some other opportunities, yeah. what was driving that? Oh, I think, I think it was the interest that I had in, in uh, various uh, subjects. And it was the opportunity to work in an area that I was really interested in, as opposed to making money. Yeah. Uh, you'll make money anyway. You know, that, that it, it's kind of hard to convince people of that. But, uh, you know, if you're working in an area that you're interested in, uh, you'll, yeah, the money will come. Uh, you don't have to worry too much about that. Uh, the, the real thing that I can't imagine is someone uh, working in an area that they just hate uh, for the money. Uh, it would seem to me that that would be the worst life you could, the worst work life you could ever live. Yeah, well, I, I think it's going to have a, an even greater impact on the rest of your life. You're miserable where you're working. Yeah. Uh, I'm wondering, Jim, um, that's, a, that's a very interesting mindset. Uh, I'm wondering if there's a mindset for you. Like if you could pass this on to anyone young in their career, um, this is a mindset that you have. You would just love to see young people grasp this mindset. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, it, it, it would be essentially what we've been talking about. So follow your... Follow your interests, uh, and uh, try to see the next thing down the road, uh, either in the discipline you you decide to follow or in some related subject. Because uh, you know we uh, uh, preserve a certain kind of of personal agility. Uh, something that uh, will allow you to move to the next thing, because this world is becoming more and faster about the me about the next thing, and uh, uh, you 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 can't stand still intellectually and and uh, and enjoy yourself to the maximum. If that's maybe that's the wrong way to put it, but th that's kind of the way I think about it. Uh, this is enjoying. Uh, enjoyment, and and we ought to we ought to uh, make the the most of our careers. I absolutely agree. I, I'm wondering for you. I don't I don't know if you're studying a lot of this recently, but for you, where are you having 
um, just kind of focus on the next thing. Like what's capturing your attention? Where, where are your spidey sense kind of going off on? I'm thinking there might be big change here. Well, we're, you know, we're in the middle of it, uh, but, but it, and it's the, it's the usual things uh, of, of immediate interest to me. And it's not the most important thing in the world is what's going on in the world of remote work and how that affects organizational culture. Uh, because I think we have real challenges ahead of us in achieving the kind of uh, effective, competitive cultures that we have seen in the recent past with people working uh, very limited times together in an office. Uh, the technology is wonderful. I realize that. And it has certain uh, great benefits. You know, we're, we're saving a lot of transportation talking here today. Uh, and time and the like. I could drive down to Fort Myers and be with you, but it would take me another hour and a half to get down there. Uh, and my day is shot. Uh, and that happens day after day in business. That's great, but uh, it's not good for organizational culture. And this is uh, going to create some real challenges for organizations, not that remote work uh, isn't important, will continue, will grow, but it's those organizations that figure out how to make it work in terms of an organizational culture that allows these remote uh, workers to represent their company in a way that that company would like to be represented, uh, you know, uh, 500 miles away from headquarters, uh, that we really need to 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 uh, to worry about, or and to and to understand, because it's the companies that are able to manage uh, to preserve an effective culture that are going to win uh, over the companies that aren't. Even though both of them are supporting a large number of of people working remotely, I I got into this as I've uh, as I mentioned in my uh, forward uh, to the book that I, that I have coming out soon, uh, the book uh, uh, Win From Within, that um, I first became intrigued uh, uh, about this uh, when J&J uh, uh, &J experienced the uh, uh, Tylenol scare, more than a scare, but the Tylenol disaster uh, back in 19, I think it was 82. Uh, a colleague of mine wrote a case about it. And when you write a case, uh, it, it wasn't so much about the, the, uh, uh, the uh, culture at J&J, but it was, the case was about this incident, if you will. It's more than an incident. And when, when, a colleague, when somebody writes a case uh, at the Harvard Business School, usually the first time that case is discussed is when you invite uh, the CEO or a senior manager of the company to come in, meet with the class and, uh, and uh, take the last 15 or 20 minutes of the class and talk to them about what they've been discussing. Usually it goes something like this, you know, I was really impressed with your discussion and all that sort of thing, and, but here's what we did and so forth. Uh, and uh, Jim Burke, who was CEO of J&J &J at the time, came to Harvard uh, one day uh, to uh, sit in on my colleague's discussion of this case. And I, you know, we invite each other to, to classes every once in a while. So I went over to sit in because uh, I was interested in the, the whole Tylenol business. And what he said really hooked me. He said, uh, you know, I wasn't, uh, this, this event occurred in Chicago. Uh, we're headquartered in New Jersey. Uh, I think that's where it is. And uh, I was on a business trip to Tokyo. Uh, and uh, these guys in Chicago, uh, the, the, what happened, of course, is that uh, 
somebody had poisoned uh, Tylenol uh, with uh, potassium cyanide and killed seven people who took those pills. And the decision had to be made as to whether to, to, to recall the product from Chicago, that specific market, or the entire United States. The entire United States, the bill for that is $100 million at the time. Those were 1982 dollars. Uh, and you had to do it fast. You know, you, you really had, and you had to get an announcement out there. And the crowd in Chicago got together and said, no, we, there, no question about it. We got to bring it all, uh, bring it all back. We've got to take it all off the shelf, $100 million. And we need to call Jim Burke. Uh, you know, he's the CEO. <laughs> After all, we need to inform him what we've done. And uh, so he gets the call and, and he said, no, no, I think you did the right thing. And Burke turns to the class and he says, you know, you know why this all happened? It was because of our corporate credo. Because these guys were living a set of values and behaviors that told them very clearly what they needed to do. So they did it and they knew that you know, maybe I, I I might have a quibble with it, but I wasn't going to uh, wasn't going to argue very strongly anyway. And they had to get it done. So his his question was, have you have you already done it, and have you got it out to, to the public? And everybody said, yeah, we have. And uh, he said, good, I'll be back in three or four days. You know, uh, so it. Uh, it a, an organizational culture in a remote work situation can be very effective, but uh, it requires a lot of nurturing. And I'm afraid that uh, organizations are going to forget uh, to do that. They're going to have to figure out just how uh, you bring people into the organization, how you orient them, how you communicate a set of values and the way we do things around here, uh, behaviors. Uh, and somehow or other, they're going to have to instill in this crowd of people working uh, remotely, uh, those values and behaviors. And I, I, I don't know whether you, I think yesterday's paper, the New York Times has a story on maybe it was Sunday, uh, you know, people are being hired and quitting without ever having seen anybody from the company. Yeah. That is, uh, other than on a screen like this, Sean, uh, they hired, <laughs> they got hired on a screen and they probably quit on a screen and never, never set foot in a company facility. Yeah. Now, so much for that, for the, uh, the goodbye handshake. Culture. Yeah. Well, one thing I, I love about the, the story you bring up there with, with Tylenol is when you have values and you live them, decision-making becomes so much easier, whether they, yeah. they be personal or within a company. Um, yeah, and you, and you bring up just, I mean, just a complex, really interesting thing is, is how do you get people to not only understand these values, these behaviors, but start living them if, if they're not part of this? Do you have any early ideas even directionally on, on what that could look like and how people can become more indoctrinated with a company's values and behaviors if it is all via remote oh sure i i think so i i uh, in the book i include a case study of an organization in canada called critical mass and critical mass is their business basically is all about uh uh, building more effective uh, organization cultures and the like. And they are, the, the, uh, the story is all about the way that they have uh, accommodated uh, a trend that is also affecting them, that, that they're up to maybe 10 or 20%. They were up to 10 or 20% of their workforce working remotely prior to the pandemic and are likely to go back, you know, to some percentage of people working remotely. And they thought a lot about how to do this. Uh, first of all, 
Sean, I think it's absolutely uh, critical that an organization build face-to-face -face contact uh, into what it does, uh, whether it's weekly or monthly or one month a year or one week a quarter or whatever it is, uh, nothing happens uh, on the values, behaviors, culture front, uh, unless you've got uh, the, unless you give people the ability to see each other in the flesh. Uh, now that, that sounds, maybe that sounds kind of like a superficial thing, but we're human beings and we naturally congregate. And the, the technology allows us to, to communicate without congregating in any way. And uh, I think you have to have some of both. And so an organization that pays a lot of attention to that, I think is going to be, uh, is going to be able to weather the storm. In the book, I, I've said, you know, don't expect any great improvements uh, as a result of remote work uh, from, uh, in, uh, in, in, the profitability that an effective culture can contribute to an organization. But those companies that are going to be successful will at least hold the line and, you'll, and, uh, and win the ties in a sense. Uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the second thing, in addition to this face-to-face -face contact, is that I, I think, and this is, a, this is a subject of discussion that I think is going to come up more and more. I think that middle management actually has an important role here. Uh, and that role may well be to uh, absorb the travel that uh, remote workers don't have to make. Uh, it may be uh, getting people together in a regional, uh, setting uh, instead of across the entire company. Uh, in other words, we might have a, a South Florida region that meets and, and uh, people have to maybe, uh, they're within 30 minutes of their meeting rather than uh, a flight across the country. Uh, I think middle managers are going to find themselves uh, with a more important role. Some of my colleagues don't. I, I, a couple of them have been writing articles about this is the death of middle management. Uh, you know, middle managers, uh, we've been trying to figure out what they do anyway, and uh, we're just going to let them go, you know, and uh, uh, we've, we've glorified, you know, flattening the organization and doing all those things in the name of speed, by the way, which I think is important. Uh, but there are other things that middle managers do rather than approve and stamp things and the like and uh, take up time. I think it was Brian Chesky, the uh, CEO of, of Airbnb, Airbnb that I quoted in the book, uh, who said that uh, uh, organizations move at the speed of trust. And what he's really referring to is the importance of people trusting each other, which is a direct uh, product, byproduct of an effective culture. That's what was going on at J&J &J in the story I mentioned. Yeah, I think uh, I think Brian Chesky might have been quoting uh, Stephen Covey there, who wrote a book, actually, his, his old Stephen did. son. Yeah, wrote, right. wrote a book, The Speed of Trust. That's right, he was. Yeah. Yeah. I, I would love to even set the some more foundation here around culture um, and, and starting with how do you define culture? Well, I, I'm uh, a, uh, maybe in this regard, I'm a student of Ed Shines. Uh, he first uh, created a, a, a hierarchy of elements in culture. First of all, starting with shared assumptions. Uh, a shared assumption might be uh, why do people work, okay? Or, or do people uh, naturally want to work? That, 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 and there, there are many uh, managers in the country that, that don't believe they do. Uh, and that's a very important starting assumption because if you don't believe people really wanna work, 
or that they're only working for the money, uh, you're going to manage much differently uh, than uh, if you believe that uh, uh, there is a higher calling here than than just the sort of the filthy lucre uh, in the job. Um, So uh, shared assumptions, uh, shared values, uh, and then uh, a set of uh, shared behaviors, and then uh, something that uh, Ed called artifacts, you know, the company picnic and those kinds of things. And uh, his point was that uh, it's very important to keep those in perspective. Uh, people often confuse them. Uh, they'll say, what? We're going to eliminate? I remember a classmate of mine, John Young, who was CEO of Hewlett Packard after he graduated from Stanford a while. Uh, who, who told me in a telephone conversation once that he had a delegation in his office complaining about the fact that uh, they weren't going to have a company picnic. Well, a company picnic at Hewlett Packard when they had a couple of hundred employees was pretty easy. But when it got to be 15,000 or something like that, he, he, he began to suggest that they not have it. Oh, big explosion, big, big problems. That's an artifact. Artifacts ought to be fairly easy to change and uh, they, don't, they don't necessarily affect uh, the culture all that much. Shared behaviors are something else. You know, how we do things around here, big deal. I think a bigger deal than the shared values if you really, or at least as important if we come right down to it. So those were the four elements that Ed sort of set forth. Uh, what I try to do is put those in a framework that, that uh, starts with the mission of the organization, because unless I know what the mission is, then it, it it's a little harder for me to hire people who really buy into that mission. Then uh, shared assumptions, shared values, shared behaviors, uh, the uh, uh, the company picnic, and then uh, it, unless you measure and take action. None of that really makes any difference. So there are, I think, two other elements that really have to be uh, included, if not in a model for company culture, because these are things you need to do almost regardless of what you do. Uh, But unless you measure and act on those measures, for example, uh, you've got a great, you know, a terrific manager from the standpoint of numbers. Uh, this, this woman is making her numbers, uh, but she doesn't quite, uh, she, she wounds people in the process and doesn't uh, take into account uh, the company's uh, emphasis on values and behaviors. What do you do? Uh, you, first of all, you've got to understand what's going on. So you have to measure not only the numbers, but you also have to measure uh, the impact of people's interactions. And secondly, uh, you've got to, if, if you don't act, uh, you've acted. You've, uh, inaction is an yeah. act uh, because everybody around this manager will uh, assume that the comp- this is the way the company operates and they actually condone what she's doing. Uh, the, so uh, action is really, really important and what, what I've found and and others around me just based on practice is that when you act against those people who can't make, who are making their numbers, but can't manage according to the values, uh, the organization immediately starts to improve its performance. Uh, Even without that person's numbers, uh, people come in, they take up the slack. uh, They now have a culture that uh, they can all believe in. And whether they work harder or whether they work smarter, something happens and they produce better performance. Jim, I, I'd love if you could illuminate. I might have this slightly wrong here. I'm almost thinking uh, two different things here, right? We've got strategy and then we have culture. Are you mm-hmm. saying here that the culture can actually outweigh strategy, meaning uh, a great culture is more adaptable? People can pick up slack where strategy might be missing off? Well, I think of it this way. Sean, uh, and, and I've asked uh, I've asked hundreds of managers about 
this whole issue. You know, if you had to allocate a hundred points to strategy and, and culture uh, and their impact on performance, uh, you know, what would you, how would you allocate it? And I, it, you might be surprised they, the, a lot of people really do emphasize, uh, they understand the importance of corporate culture. This is something I'd like to get to in a minute. It's not that uh, people don't understand it. I think we've, we've written enough about it that they all get it. Uh, there's something here that's really important. But in any event, I think that uh, a culture can provide you with uh, much longer term performance that is an effective culture than a strategy. I like to think of a culture as providing an effective culture as providing a foundation in support of any one of several related strategies uh, that can't be too too different but uh and in fact uh, if you believe as uh, rita uh, gunther mcgrath believes that um you know no strategy is appropriate anymore for for very long and that in fact uh long-range planning is completely obsolete as a result then you've got to believe that a, an effective culture that supports several strategies, which is basically when you, you come right down to it, uh, it, it's the concept of organizational agility, which is such a big deal these days, then you gotta believe that an effective culture is a very important element of long-term success. I don't, uh, I, I, I don't try to, deal with the question of which is more important. I think that strategies and changing a culture at the time you're changing a strategy can be a pretty effective way of changing a culture. That's basically what went on at Microsoft when, uh, where they uh, shifted from the word, from an emphasis on word uh, to the cloud and had to change everybody's way of thinking at the same time that they decided that they were going to uh, modify this uh, ineffective culture that had built up uh, sort of by implication in, under the first two CEOs that the company ever had. I'm actually, I'm, I'm wondering if you could dive further into that or if you have any other case studies around companies, cultures who, who started off and we can just call them terrible and made that transition to great. Um, I would love to know what that process is like, because I'm, I'm sure a lot of people are thinking if they're in a culture uh, that isn't great to be a part of, they're thinking this right. is impossible. There, there's no way to change this. Well, uh, you, you have uh, my, my first uh, experiences with culture I mentioned were Shoalice Hospital and Southwest Airlines. Uh, those were not uh, culture change examples, because those were two organizations that were, uh, uh, were started with unique and effective cultures that have prevailed over the years. Even though one of these organizations was in the business of, of doing, uh, performing inguinal hernias, largely on men. And the other one was in the business of flying people around the United States. First of all, Texas, flying people around Texas. And then uh, <clears throat> some neighboring states and then the United States uh, and largely not internationally. So, uh, but those were cultures that weren't changed. They were created in a sense. They were shaped uh, originally. Organizations that have had to undergo culture change uh, that I talk about in the book, in addition to Microsoft, certainly um, our Uber, uh, something had to be done at Uber. Uh, the, uh, and it involved more than just replacing the CEO slash founder. Uh, there were all kinds of things that had to be done. And uh, a, a colleague of mine, Francis Fry, was hired to go in and essentially help them uh, 
to um, find out what it was they really wanted. Because you, first of all, you, <laughs> you've got to ask people, what, what, what kind of an organization do you want to work in? Uh, and how does that relate to what this organization is like today? Uh, so how do we, and, and now how are we going to get from here to there? Uh, and you, you only do it by involving, in her case, thousands of people uh, in thousands of hours of, uh, first of all, uh, discussions in small groups about uh, what needs to be done, okay? Uh, at least in their view. Uh, and how, we're, how are we going to do it? Uh, but first of all, what needs to be done? What are the values that we really uh, would be useful to this organization? But, and here's my bias again, what are the behaviors uh, evidenced by each of these values? That is, if we say uh, integrity is one of our values, okay, what is it? What are we going to do? What, what's the, you know, uh, how are we going to uh, act that out, if you will? So if you get an agreement in a small group on values and behaviors, you would at least have something you can float to the rest of the organization and get because it's important to involve the rest of the organization relatively early, not at the beginning, but relatively early in the whole process. Who talked about IPN, that actually? Yeah, I would love to know. Yeah, please dive further on that. Yeah. Uh, uh, for example, at IBM, um, uh, sir, it was Sam Palmasano. Palm, uh, had this discussion in a small group, but also had what they called a values jam, which was conducted over the internet. 100, 130,000 people provided inputs. This information was then all organized uh, and processed, and actually uh, IBM's values were altered slightly, but altered to reflect a more global orientation for the company. And the results were reported back so that everybody has had a chance to participate in a process that smelled like change management, you know? Well, we're, we're doing something. And then uh, the, uh, the behaviors associated with those values were uh, essentially communicated down through the organization and the, and the word was spread. At the same time, the performance management system has to take those changes into account. And this is where uh, things really start to go wrong quite often. Uh, there, if there's a disconnect between the way people's performances are being uh, measured and the way they're being compensated, uh, then forget the whole process because uh, you're not communicating a consistent message at all. People down in the organization don't know what to believe or how to act. And so they continue doing what they were doing in the past. So the whole performance measurement system has to be changed. The, the, the job training has to be changed. Uh, we often think, well, yeah, we have to, we have to change our orientation. If we got new values, we better uh, make sure that's part of our orientation. And then we don't go any further than that. Uh, you say, well, we did that. Uh, now we're, uh, uh, now we're making change. No, you haven't made any change at all. So all of these processes, uh, have to be altered to reflect what the organization has said it wants to do. And then you've got th this whole business that I write about of acting out uh, the new values, the new behaviors. Uh, uh, managers have to visibly 
visibly act out those behaviors. It may require changing individuals. It may require uh, 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 360 degree evaluations of, you know, how's your boss, how's, how am I doing as your boss uh, on these particular issues? And so it's a multi-step process. I actually uh, spell it out in the book, uh, Win From Within in 16 steps uh, at, at kind of arrayed sequentially, even though these don't all happen sequentially. Uh, and with the idea in mind that this process, and this is again, where uh, the book is going to produce an argument because uh, one of the fallacies, I believe, that has discouraged senior managers from doing anything about culture, even though they know it's important for performance. Uh, one of the, the fallacies is that it takes for a long time to change an organization's culture. And uh, I only have, you know, I'm only gonna be in this job another year and a half uh, as CEO, or um, I can't hold the, the organization's attention for that long. We've got other things to do, you know? And this has gotta be, if this has gotta be front burner, I'm not gonna be able to keep it there for very long. So you've gotta have a process that plants the seeds and gets things started within six months. Or uh, I would argue, uh, you're going to have a large number of people who aren't even trying to change the culture, hmm. or in addition to uh, a large number that don't succeed. At, l at least if you define success as a complete uh, change to an effective culture, which I think we tend to do. Uh, Management consultants these days tell us, they're very reputable management consultants, that about one in four efforts to change culture actually succeed. First of all, I'm not sure they're measuring it correctly, uh, measuring change. Uh, and secondly, they're scaring, you know, an additional number of CEOs away from even trying. So it's, it's a little like uh, climate change, you know, I know it's going on and I know we have a problem, uh, but, and we'll fix it someday. Mm. And someday never comes. Mm. I'm thinking about some of these leaders. I mean, over, over your career, you've worked with hundreds and hundreds of different leaders uh, of the best leaders you've been able to study and to research. Are, are there, are, are there commonalities amongst them? I, I think, I think so. Uh, but I haven't thought a lot about that. <clears throat> I haven't written all that much about leadership, but uh, I think about two very different leaders that, um, that had a real impact on me. And I, I write about both of them in the book. Um, first of all, Herb Kelleher uh, at Southwest Airlines. I, I spent a fair amount of time with Herb. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, and uh, here was a guy, who uh, loved the company's employees. He loved the company and its people. And you always capitalize people if you use it in relation to Southwest Airlines. You always capitalize customers as well, but customers and people or employees, they'll call them employees, but you gotta capitalize, capitalize it with an E. Uh, so, and he spent a lot of time with him, uh, and, uh, but, but maintained a sense of integrity. The casual observer would say, you know, here's a guy, here's a party animal. He loves parties. He go to parties and, uh, and his behavior would probably be unacceptable today if he didn't carry it out with integrity. You know, uh, he was a favorite of the, of the women in the organization. Uh, 
and uh, they all had a wonderful time together at, a, at company parties. Uh, there are thousands of photos at headquarters, you know, showing uh, various employees with Kelleher and, and other top managers. But he, he, had, he knew his limits. He knew his limits, you know, did he, did he drink? Yes, he drank, uh, but a very disciplined kind of guy. Uh, you know, uh, sure, he, he, he behaved uh, according to some of those stories, but um, uh, there was a real, uh, not only a business sense, but a moral sense about that guy. The other person, uh, another person who recently died as well, was Jack Bogle over at Vanguard. Yeah. Uh, just the opposite. Uh, Jack, until the day he died, was a preppy. He dressed like a preppy. He behaved like a preppy. He, he, he was proper New England prep school all the way. Uh, but he had a little bit of a maverick in him and certainly a great deal of integrity. He built an organization of people who weren't there primarily for the money. Uh, uh, just as Southwest, you know, Southwest is not the highest paying airline in the country. They were there for other reasons. They were there because uh, the, the nature of the work was of interest to them. They were there because the company had a set of values that rewarded you if you were able to deliver services to our clients at lower cost. Vanguard was all about cost, frugality was the, it, it was, it is a still, uh, the, it, people are still frugal, even though uh, they may not talk about it as much because that's just the way you do it at Vanguard. That was the, that's a basic element of the company strategy. There still is, uh, is no way to invest for the long term, probably at a lower cost than at Vanguard, regardless of performance. Uh, and it was due to, to Jack Bogle, the guy, was naturally uh, proper, frugal. Uh, he was not, uh, neither, both were generous. Ne uh, both knew when they'd had enough. Uh, Bogle wrote a book titled Enough. Uh, enough is when you have, when you think you have enough uh, and uh, enough to sustain you in life and to, to help those around you, uh, your loved ones sustain themselves, whatever. That's enough. Well, what more can you do? You know, an extra $5 billion? What, did, what does it mean? It doesn't mean anything. Bogle was not an extremely uh, rich guy. He had plenty of money. I, uh, he may have had uh, he may have had nine figures, I doubt it, but he may have. Uh, but hey, uh, he, he, he didn't have to have a lot, he had enough. And so the, there was a spirit of generosity, uh, a, a spirit of, of knowing your limits, kind of discipline involved, which then allows you to release a lot of energy within the organization because people can uh, can act on their own. At Vanguard, they know exactly what will be regarded as effective management behavior. And the, the story I tell in the book, which has been told elsewhere, uh, of uh, uh, Mabel Yu, who uh, didn't invest in anything that she didn't understand. And in, 19, in 2008, 2009, uh, uh, with the derivatives, she didn't understand those at all. And so on Wall Street, uh, and, and as a consequence, didn't invest. And on Wall Street, you know, people made fun of her. Nobody made fun of her at, uh, at Vanguard. And as a result, Vanguard was hardly touched yeah. by the 2008, 2009, you know, uh, financial disaster. <laughs> Her reward, as I describe in the book, 
is lunch with Jack Bogle. And uh, she goes for lunch in the company cafeteria, the galley. It's the Vanguard is all about uh, Lord Nelson, I guess it is, uh, who was a hero of Jack's. Uh, so you go to the company cafeteria and Mabel orders uh, a salad. It's probably a three or four dollar item on the company cafeteria thing. She came out, people said, don't you have, what'd you do? Had, had a great, great meal there. She said, well, I had a salad. It's when you what? You had a salad? Yeah, she said, I didn't want to spend too much. You know, I, I didn't want to take advantage of, of, of this uh, uh, nice invitation and the like. You, you do something really great at Vanguard and you get a $5 certificate to go to the company cafeteria. Hmm. So uh, uh, the, the, this whole idea of frugality is, is important. It's, it's important at Southwest as well. Uh, we, you write about, uh, people write about, you know, Southwest going to great lengths to uh, service customers. Um, that's all money well spent. You don't spend money foolishly at Southwest. And so there are common values in leaders of that sort you, that when taken all together, seem to inspire people while communicating to them exactly what's expected uh, and what is expected is often a certain latitude to do what you think is proper for the company that you're working for. You know, I tell the story at Southwest Airlines of the agent who, uh, who has to decide in a split moment whether to put a foul smelling guy in, in rags uh, sitting in a wheelchair in front of her on the plane or not, even though he's got a valid ticket. Uh, if she turns him down, it's an immediate public relations disaster. Uh, on the other hand, how is she gonna get him on the plane? That's her decision to make at Southwest because the, 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 the behavior, the shared behavior is do whatever you feel comfortable doing for a customer. And the same is true at Vanguard. That is not you know, a, a profligate way of, 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 of managing because people will not overstep their bounds. Well, so, Jim you asked me about leaders. Those are two that I uh, that I'll never forget. Yeah, no, no, I, I love the stories, and and one of the things that that I really appreciate about those stories, two completely different types of leaders, similar to the different types of cultures, right? Like, there's not one. This is not the mold for great culture. They're right. different. They're varying, and different people succeed in different cultures, which is one of the reasons I appreciate your work so much. Um, and, and you understand some of those things. You, you, you've worked with so many great leaders, so many different companies. Uh, obviously, you have an enormous bookshelf behind you. Are, are there any other books or ideas that have really influenced you or your thinking? I know how much your work and, and your books have influenced me. I'm wondering for you. Uh, in, in the area of uh, uh, organizational culture? No, I'm, I'm thinking about foundational books um, that probably have fundamentally shifted the way you approach things or view the world. Jay, I... <laughs> <laughs> that's just a nice light question here uh, <laughs> uh you know over uh over a long period of time uh, that list uh, gets pretty long i in each of the areas that i've worked i probably uh, uh was inspired by uh certain people i uh, my guess is that um um, there were a couple of guys that were, that I admired, uh, going way back to, to the logistics era. Um, and, uh, they were doing, they were doing their work up at, uh, Michigan state where a lot of work was being done in a field called that they called physical distribution management. So there were, there were, uh, Ed Smike and Don Bowersox wrote a book called physical distribution management that 
uh, was quite influential uh, in uh, my early days. Um, the book I wrote called Business Logistics came out at almost the same time, but it was a little, a little later. Uh, but I always regarded them as, uh, as valued colleagues. Don and I actually did a speaking, three week speaking tour of Japan uh, back in those days. Uh, as far as service management goes, I, uh, my, my colleagues at Harvard uh, had uh, written a case book that was influential to me, uh, Earl Sasser and Daryl Wyckoff, uh, that uh, uh, influenced uh, my work. And that came out about the same time I wrote uh, uh, this book called Managing in the Service Economy. Um, the, uh, at the time, there really wasn't a lot of work going on in the service sector. Uh, we were still infatuated with manufacturing. And um, uh, so some of my inspiration there was just from the field of general management, I think. Uh, going way back, way back to the time of my doctoral uh, uh, work, when I had to, when you, these were the days at Stanford when you had to learn two languages for research purposes. So you had to, you had to take a reading exam uh, for these languages. And I took, the two easiest I could think of was were French and Spanish. So, uh, I read uh, Henri Fayol's 19th century book on, uh, on management, which I will never forget because I had to learn, <laughs> had to learn French to be able to read it and understand it. And he wrote a lot about uh, the span of control and, uh, and uh, uh, getting organizations to march in the same direction and the like. So that probably would be one of my uh, foundational works. I mentioned uh, the Deal and Kennedy book on corporate culture, but uh, I think uh, a book that influenced all of us was, was uh, Peters and Waterman's book, uh, In Search of Excellence. Uh, I never met either of them, uh, but I can imagine that uh, both of them uh, could have been very inspiring people uh, to, uh, uh, to work with and to, to think with. Um, as I mentioned, uh, Ed Schein's book is, you know, is foundational in, in the area of uh, organization culture, even though it appeared, uh, it came out two or three years after um, Peters, Peters and Waterman's book. I can't believe it now, but that, that's the sequence as it happened. Um, and, and, and then, John Cotter's work. John, uh, John and I worked together, but he did, you know, he's done a lot of work in, in leading and managing change. And uh, to the extent that we all uh, work in the field of managing change, uh, his work has to be uh, very influential for me. John was kind enough to write a foreword uh, to this book, Win From Within, uh, John and I did a, a piece of work together that was published in 1992, I believe, uh, that uh, essentially uh, showed uh, by num numbers and verse uh, that uh, strong cultures uh, can be just as damaging as they are uh, rewarding uh, unless you uh, emphasize values that will support uh, what we called at the time adaptability. Today it would be agility, I'm sure, but uh, then we were looking for adaptable values. Uh, and we found uh, that uh, companies that had strong and adaptable cultures uh, could uh, earn as much as several hundred percent more than their counterparts over a 10-year period. Uh, 
which we measured for some 200 odd companies at the time. So it was a, it was really the first major effort to put numbers around this whole notion of corporate culture. And so it's, to me, it's quite fitting that 30 years later, John and I uh, have had a chance at least to sit down and talk about those issues to the extent that he was willing to write a foreword uh, for my book, uh, which really traces over time what we've learned about the impact of culture on performance. Um, we know a lot about it now. Yeah. Uh, a number of studies have been done. And I think we're going to find out a lot more as we go forward. Yeah, and, and what you guys have been able to, to uncover there in terms of company performance over time. I have to imagine there's a, there's a lot of investors who, who want to bring you on to, uh, to, to understand different companies and what their trajectory is going to be like looking forward. I do have... <laughs> You know, it's, it's strange to mention that I do have a group of investors who have been very uh, investment managers, not yeah. investors, but uh, one group of investment managers has been very helpful to me. They're, they're California based. Uh, they come visit me in Florida every once in a while. And uh, uh, they, uh, their entire, not their entire, uh, but an important element of their investment strategy uh, has been corporate culture and they are very diligent um, in uh, allowing culture to break all ties when it comes to alternative investments. Mm -hmm. Jim, I, I know the, the new book, Win From Within, uh, We'll have the details lined up with that so listeners can pick that up. Um, also, I, I wanna just highlight once again, uh, the culture cycle because of the impact it had on me. Uh, I'm wondering for you though, as we round this conversation out, is there anyone dead or alive, just not a family member or friend that if you could sit down with, have a long form conversation like this, you, you would love to, to just ask them anything? Oh man. Uh, about corporate culture? No, anything in general. <laughs> Well, I don't know. I, you know, you always think about there were a lot of things I never had a chance to talk to my father about uh, that uh, that you uh, wish you could explore. Um, uh, wow, this that's a tough one. I, you know, I I wouldn't single out any one person. Um, uh, <laughs> Depends on a lot, you know. You, you have to be a good conversationalist first of all. <laughs> Otherwise, you're not going to have much of a conversation. But uh, you know, there are there there. In addition to people I've mentioned, um, uh, there are uh, managers that have uh, that have influenced me a great deal. I I uh, uh, I think Lou Gerstner would. It, 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 be one. He was a former yeah, over at IBM. IBM. Uh, Lou is still around and, and is somebody that uh, I don't know well, but uh, have have uh, had him in a uh, you know in a group discussion in the past. Um, uh, the uh, and, and a, a very stimulating, very thoughtful uh, kind of guy. Uh, one of my colleagues uh, is a guy named Len Schlesinger. Len has uh, uh, had a varied career. Uh, he was at one time president of Babson College uh, in between stints at the Harvard Business School. Len is somebody that I do converse with every month or two. We, we, we get on, uh, on Zoom, just as we are today. And we, we talk not about, you know, well, for two minutes, maybe how's the family and all that sort of thing, uh, but mostly about what's going on in, uh, not only at the Harvard Business School where Len is a, uh, a long-term professor, but uh, in the field of management in general. Uh, Len is a great 
student of managers. He has managed in several organizations uh, in addition to Babson College and comes with a lot of experience uh, and a lot of interesting ideas. For example, uh, in talking about uh, my this book that is coming out, Win From Within, uh, Len, I'm, I, I'm sure, uh, is, is not certain, he's raised the question, as to how fast you can change an organization's culture. His field is organizational behavior going way back. And uh, he still is influenced by, uh, by the complexities of change in organizations. Probably, you know, rightfully so, I'm sure. Uh, and he's just not quite sure he buys in on that, but it's the kind of issue that's important to be able to discuss. Uh, uh, and it's important to be able to have somebody to discuss it with. So certainly Lynn is, he's uh, uh, influenced me over the years. He's somebody that I still, <laughs> I still enjoy talking with, which is, you know, he survived the test. And uh, so I would include him on the, in the dinner party, if that's, yeah. if that's what we're organizing here. Yeah, that works great. Jim, <laughs> do you have a, uh, a publication date of when the book, When From Within, will be coming out? The book, the book will be out, I think, in November. Okay. Uh, the publication date will be 2022, but uh, that's, the, that's the publisher's uh, uh, preference. But there will be uh, physical copies of the book, I think, in early November. And, Fantastic. And well, I'll Jim. certainly make sure you, uh, you, get, you get a copy. Yeah, no, the, the advanced copy is great. So I, I appreciate that. Um, you already know how, how much your work's in, impacted me. So James Heskett, I cannot thank you enough for joining us on What Got You There. Thank you, Sean. Uh, it's been a really pleasant uh, conversation. Got to there with Sean Delaney.